In The Sopranos Season 2 Episode 4, Tony, Paulie and Christopher go to Napoli in order to strike up a deal with one of the mafioso families there. While they are there, they suffer a bit of a culture shock. Throughout the series thus far, and later on, one of the prime characteristics of the members of Tony's crew is the pride they have in their Italian heritage. Being Italian American is a facet of their being that they routinely reference. In fact, a lot of the time it is their being. Criticisms of anything Italian are criticisms against them, as seen in episode 3 of season 4, which to this day conservatives don't seem to understand the point of. He discovered America is what he did. He was a brave Italian explorer, and in this house Christopher Columbus is a hero. End of story. But now actually being in Italy and experiencing actual Italian culture, there was a clash. The food is different. They can barely communicate. They are actually a bit shocked by how the mob carries out their business there. They come to realize that they actually aren't part of this culture and aren't really too pleased with this realization. It's a good episode. Surprise is a good show. Final Fantasy XIII is quite an anomaly. The installment was pretty panned critically by the series' usual standards and definitely was not well received by the fans. And yet it would go on to receive two sequels, a carnage which would not be extended to well received Square Enix releases. Surely there must be some kind of reason as to why. Well, that is our focus today. We'll be taking a look at the criticisms that have been flung its way, as well as attempt to give a fair and thorough analysis, as much as of a first bit of that criteria as possible, and see if we can truly get to the nub of the matter. Thirteen released in a bit of a weird time for the franchise. Since Final Fantasy IX's release in 2000 served as a much admired and acclaimed celebration of the series, Square Enix were kind of left fumbling around about what to do next. Following his completion and working on it, Hironobu Sakaguchi turned his attention to the spirits within. As a result, the franchise would see a frantic shuffling of its management, to the point where the flurry of games were released in the first decade of the millennium would pretty much always have a different producer or director. Also without his presence, one of Sakaguchi's core principles was soon broken. A firm believer in the lack of a need for sequels or remasters, the series were going to pursue its upscale port of the classics and the sequels slash spin-offs for Final Fantasy IV, X, VII and XII. This would also be the point where we would begin to see an experimentation with the general style and gameplay of the installments. Final Fantasy XI was an MMO for example. All this combined to the release of some controversial titles. X and XII were critically acclaimed and sold well, but both had been a bit contentious as a result of their changes to the general format. And now that the father of Final Fantasy was completely out of the picture, what could be expected from the first mainline installment released in his absence? The answer is an installment with a number of unique issues of its own, even away from this context. It wouldn't be correct to say that Final Fantasy XIII went through development hell, but it certainly wasn't anything particularly heavenly. The development began in 2004, with it only see release in 2009-10, quite a distance from the 2006 of Final Fantasy XII, and this was actually the continuation of a trend that had begun with its predecessor, as it also saw protracted development. A noticeable break from the release cycle before, with Seven releasing in 1997, 8 in 1999, 9 in 2000, 10 in 2001, and 11 in 2002. In fact, the largest gap between two final releases before that of 11 and 12 was the three years between 6 and 7, and given that they saw the movement from 2D sprites to 3D models, a new console, transferring from cartridge to CD, introduction of CGI, just to name a few, it makes sense to be fair. And 13 did face a few similar challenges, it was initially planned to release on PS2, but development was later shifted onto PS3, which not only led to an expansion in the scope, but it also meant the need to acclimatize to a new firmware, and specifically a firmware notoriously difficult to code for. Added to this was the fact that later on in development, the decision was also made to develop for Xbox 360. Combined with all these technical aspects was the story writing component. As already mentioned in my fabulously riveting Type 0 video, 13 forms part of the fabulous notebook of Starless. In fact, it was actually the launch pad for the whole series and so extensive planning was laid out for how to detail all this law, entire books written in order to explain it all. And what was the end result of this extended development cycle? Well it's certainly a game. Final Fantasy XIII really is a weird one to pin down. It's objectively flawed at the very least, and crippled by poor design and narrative choices at the worst. Please know when it comes to design, I said choices, not just poor design. The game is polished and pretty much bug free, something which Square Enix developed titles generally seem to achieve. But let's see if we can actually pin down where on the scale we are lying here. Let us get started with the meat and potatoes. As I said earlier, and is pretty well known, 13 saw the continuation of the experimentation in terms of combat which the series, well to be honest, has always fiddled with. 
with it was twos I'll just goals like leveling up system, the job changing of three and five, the mix and match magic teaching of six and seven, the draw system of eight, the learning abilities from equipment of nine, or the return to completely turn-based battling of 10, with the addition of switching party members mid-battle. The series has always made combat related changes with each installment, though I suppose it could be argued that it was only from 12 that a truly radical overhaul was done, in the mainline series at least. Obviously tactics was a major overhaul, and in doing so it implemented the best part of the game. Not to spoil my opinion so early, but I would say that the core combat is the only feature of 13 which isn't associated with a noticeable flaw. That's not to say it's flawless, it remains enjoyable throughout and the niggles only become truly frustrating if you're battling or grinding for a prolonged period. Let's run through a quick explainer of the combat system for the uninitiated. The player only controls one party member, the person that they designate to be the party leader, while the others behave according to their instructed role. More on that very soon. The character has a set number of ATB bars which need to be filled. While they fill up the player's bar, it's up to them to pick how they wish for the bars to be used, with the different abilities costing different amounts of bars. The player can select the order they wish to chain their abilities in, and also don't have to use all their bars if they really don't want to, instead maybe opting them to be used for later. And while they're doing this, the team is doing the same according to their assigned role, their role being determined by the main feature of the combat. It may be a little confusing to get your head around at first, but the paradigm system is very rewarding and enjoyable once you reach an adept amount of knowledge of it. At its core it's like the job system, but the job system on the fly, being able to change it in the middle of the battle. There are 6 classes that the characters can switch between, the commander for non elemental assaults and bonuses on staggered enemies, we will be getting to staggering momentarily, the ravager for combat magic and staggering enemies in the first place, the medic for healing, the synergist for party buffs, the saboteur for debuffing enemies, and the sentinel for soaking up damage. On the menu, you can create different arrangements of these paradigms and then switch between them in battle. And you need to switch. In a reflection of good sign, you need to regularly change between roles and adjustment with the situation. And even more importantly, all of the roles are actually useful, which is achieved by attention to detail that honestly, Final Fantasy games have tended to drop the ball on. If I was in charge of overseeing the production of Final Fantasy games, and what a wonderful world that would be, and these 6 classes were brought to me, I would show absolutely no concern for the Commander, Ravager or Medic classes. Warriors and Mage have always been well represented and well constructed in the Final Fantasy series, as have the healers, though I do think it's also pretty difficult to mess up healing magic, I mean you could make the healing not significantly proportional to the damage dealt or cost too much MP or something, but that's beside the point. The two classes I would be worried about are the Saboteur and the Synergist. While the buff spells have been present from early on, the use has always been somewhat clunky. In some cases, the damage mitigation they provide just doesn't justify the MP and time taken to cast the various spells that need to be cast, especially if you're going to be casting it on the whole party. And then added to this is the fact that you'll mostly only be using these spells against bosses, bosses who are quite likely to have done a fair amount of damage in the time you have spent casting, so you kind of place yourself on the back foot from the get go. And then of course, a lot of bosses also have forms of dispel, so your work can be quite easily undone. And then often, you also get a kind of all encompassing spell or ability, which does a lot of the work for you. And so while yes, probably might address the problem of casting time, it also pretty much invalidates all of the other spells. We can also see a similar issue with the debuff spells, in that their use is also mostly unnecessary. Again, you will mostly be using them against bosses, since you'll have no problem dispatching regular enemies just using attacks and black magic but the bosses are immune to most of the better debuff magic and it's not like they even have a 100% chance of success when you cast them, so you can easily just waste time and MP trying to cast spells that aren't even effective. All this together is capped off by the fact you can pretty much just navigate the majority of the game by just using attacks, black magic and summons. 13 handles the support magic perfectly. Firstly, they are actually effective, shell and protect give a substantial improvement to magic and physical defense respectively, and D shell and D protect depleted by a similar amount. Poison is ridiculously strong and even death still does damage even if it doesn't succeed with its one hit KO it exists for. 
The second contributory factor is the greatly improved Libra or Sense, which tells exactly which elements an enemy is immune to, so you don't end up just wasting time throwing spells in uncertainty. And thirdly, and probably most importantly for a massive noob such as myself, because you can assign the saboteur and synergist roles to the two party members you don't control, those of us who tend to forget about buffing and debuffing, or aren't sure about the best order in which you apply the two, have the AI to do it for them. But of course, what is even more important than making the spells competent, is balancing their usefulness. It is one thing to have very good weapons and abilities, but it doesn't matter if you don't actually need to use them, since the more straightforward alternatives get the job done. Conversely, you don't want a situation where you are so overpowered that it just breaks the game. And 13 gets that balance done very well. A lot of the stronger enemies have their own buffs and debuffs, which will require you to do so in kind, or they'll just naturally do a pretty large amount of damage, so raising your defense or weakening their attacks will be necessary. Or you can be swamped by a sizable number of enemies, so you might want to speed yourself up to get more hits in, or slow down an enemy who attacks far too much. But conversely, there are also just moments where it might be better just to go on full assault. To wrap up the paradigm system, I just quickly want to talk about the sentinel role. This is another one where it would be a fine line between it being useful and a pile of stinky plops. But again, it is well balanced. The amount of damage that the sentinel is able to absorb and the ability to pull enemies attention onto themselves make them ideal as support whilst carrying out healing or synergist and saboteur work. But again, you cannot just stick with one formation. There will be battles where you will not use a role at all and others where it will be the main feature of your lineup. And honestly, it feels very rewarding to figure out a successful combination and strategy for defeating an enemy. But let us now move on to the other core aspect of combat. The feature of combat that seems to have become a bit of a series staple now, appearing in 13 sequels and Final Fantasy VII remakes. And you could maybe argue that the berserk strikes you can do on stronger enemies in Type 0 that incapacitate them are also a kind of staggering as well. Staggering is very simple, but effective. You attack to fill the opponent's chain, and once you have done so, they enter a staggered state and take 200% damage, and are also vulnerable to a range of attacks from the commander role in particular. Often, it also breaks down their resistances and adds some vulnerabilities as well. So now this might seem like it will create a rather tedious gameplay loop of just build the stagger chain and then wail on them but it isn't actually that simple. Firstly, it just isn't always that easy to build the stagger gorge in the first place, specifically with tougher enemies who will require you to continuously rotate to rolls that don't build the chain. And you also have some enemies who just can't be staggered, or their stagger gauge is so high that you're more likely just to kill them before you actually fill the chain. Also, sometimes it's just better not to stagger. There are some enemies who unlock more attacks after recovering from stagger, and so it might be better just to not let them do that. And then, there also comes the challenge of maximizing the period during which the opponent is staggered. The ideal, of course, is just to go full-blown assault, but given that the opponent isn't actually stunned, you still need to be careful about getting too overzealous and then going to splat. So we have a truly well-designed and thoughtful combat system. It's not perfect though, and in order to be truly fair, I do think we need to take a look at some of those flaws. The combat has received a fair bit of criticism for its auto-battle feature, with complaints being that it pretty much plays the game for you. And it's not really a criticism I have time for, because well, firstly, just don't use the auto battle feature, but also, as I have mentioned earlier, you need to be constantly aware of the situation and switch to the right paradigms. So even if you are spamming auto attack, you still need to be thinking and being an active participant. Also, when you are grinding, it's kind of nice to have an auto battle feature, for enemies that are just a formality. No, the first item on the list of niggles is... No wait, that's, that's the wrong one. Like its PSP fabula counterpart, 13 also has moments of random difficulty spiking. While it's not as severe or frequent as Type 0, it still pops up and is quite frustrating. I will talk about it more later though, as the difficulty isn't necessarily a combat related issue, more due to other factors. But of course, difficulty does mean the battles may take longer, which means I can complain about something else. Honestly, I just dislike scores and rankings in general. It is really disheartening and quite annoying to struggle through and finally defeat a tough encounter and then be given a D ranking, telling you how shit you are. And 13 does the ranking in one of the worst ways. It is purely based on how quickly you complete the battle. Something which is rather difficult to do on your first battle, which is obviously fine for enemies you're going to fight multiple times, 
but not so much for one-off bosses. There also doesn't seem to be much consistency when it comes to determining the ranking. There are occasions where you are like 15 seconds quicker than the target time and then only receive 3 stars, and on other occasions you will be like 2 seconds shorter and get 5 stars. Now if this was an arbitrary ranking that maybe just at most determined how much skill you receive or something, that would be fine, but it is actually rather important for another aspect of the combat I'm not a massive fan of. In addition to the abilities in the abilities tab, there's also a technique tab with, well, techniques. You can only have a maximum of 5 technique points at a time, and they are replenished by chaining together attacks, which adds a pitiful amount to the bar, so mainly by earning high rankings in battle. Each of these techniques has a value allotted to it, and honestly, some of them should just be worth zero. Most of the techniques really are not worth it, there's only like two that I would genuinely use regularly. We have Quake for one technical point, really not that good. It does earth damage and bumps up the stagger chain, but you can just do that by attacking and it takes away a technical point which could be better used for other techniques. Stopka for one technical point, it clears all ATB gauges, allies and enemies alike, so not that great really. Libra for one technical point, I'm going to be a bit of a hypocrite here because I did say earlier about how good Libra is, but after a while you realise it's not that useful. It reveals the enemy's vulnerabilities and weaknesses, but it doesn't reveal all the information. It can also quite easily be made redundant by the Libra scope, which is an item that does Libra but on all the enemies in the battle. Also, just from fighting you will slowly discover the resistances and weaknesses of the enemies, so if it's an enemy you're specifically going to be fighting regularly, you will just gradually get that information. Thirdly, it also just encourages you to cheat. Since you have the option to retry battles, which will put you back to just before the battle starts, you can use Libra, find out the info you want, and then retry the battle knowing the weaknesses which really is just not very sporting. Next, Dispelga for one technical point. One of the two good techniques. It removes all status ailments from enemies and allies. It is a bit annoying that it will remove debuffs you placed on an enemy, but if the enemy has buffed themselves up ridiculously, or debuffed your party ridiculously, it is good to have to just reset everything. And lastly, Renew for two technical points. The best technique in the game. It revives any fallen party members and restores everyone's health for 50% of their maximum. I don't think I need to explain why that's good. The other three I've detailed aren't terrible, it's just that they aren't worth the technique points they take away to be used by two much better techniques. The last one I'm going to talk about though is a lot more flawed. Summons, Espers, GFs, Eidolons, Aeons, Avatars, Primals, Astrals, Totemas, whatever name you'd like to give your grumbly girls that you beckon for destruction, they are almost as entwined with Final Fantasy as Crystals, Chocobos and the party member who the boss is always able to kill just before they die and so deprive them of experience points. They have been in the series since the first game, but it only became a weapon in your arsenal from 3, and they have always been something that you really want to get. There's always great excitement when you receive a new summon you can unleash on the squirrels. They have the ability to change the course of battle. In fact, they are so effective that they are often pretty difficult to find, or a challenge or a puzzle will need to be completed to obtain them, or sometimes you actually have to fight them to gain them. And because of their OPness, they also need to be balanced once you use them, meaning there needs to be constraints to stop you from spamming them every turn. This has been done by making them cost a lot of MP, only letting them be used a certain amount of time in battle, or both making them only appear under a certain condition, or you have Ten's idea that they can be knocked out and you actually have to level them up if you want them to be really broken. 13 struggles with dealing with them in all regards. Firstly, there are only 6 Eidolons in the entire game, and they are tied to a specific character, so in combat you can only use the party leader summon, which is already pretty restrictive. But regardless of that, they just aren't very good in combat. Once summoned, they enter the battle and fight alongside their summoner, a bit analogous to Final Fantasy X. However, the difference is that they aren't there until knocked out or told to jog on, instead they have a time which tickles down until entering gestalt mode from which you can use a variety of attacks which use up a value until they leave with their signature move. In order to get the value higher you must fill up the gestalt bar by chaining attacks before changing over, and all this effort just doesn't seem worth it because the damage output really is not that great. Summons just aren't as tide turning or impactful as they were in the previous installments. You could argue they are pretty good at staggering, and they do have an advantage that once they unsummon, is that what you call it, the entire party is fully healed. But they just don't justify the price tag, especially since they cost 3 technical points. That's a renew and the spolger. 
Though actually the worst summon related aspect is the means by which you acquire them. The battles with the Eidolons don't work like a normal battle. Instead of attempting to stagger or drain HP, you need to fulfill the Gestalt bar. In order to do this, you need to do some tasks that tickle their pickle, focusing on healing, buffing, debuffing, etc etc. But the issue here is you don't actually know exactly what it is that they want you to do. And then the time at first it takes to figure it out, and then actually do it, means you'll probably be dead by that point. Because they cast Doom at the beginning of the battle, and so time is at a premium. And then they also attack you while you do this, so you need to spend time healing and defending as well, which might not help with filling the Gestalt bar. Also, on a much smaller note, I'm just not a massive fan of their designs. I just don't really like the mechanical automobile look. Give me sexy Koei Tecmo Shiva over motorbike Shiva any day of the week. But as I've said, the combat is well done and these are not such massive problems. So let's run off some even more minor niggles before we finally do move on. While I appreciate the fact that they attempted to make combat seem more lively, sometimes the getting about, particularly by one doofus, as a small delay to the attack, which means the stagger chain can run out before the attack actually comes in play. When switching roles, it does a little mini cutscene, which doesn't actually pause the game, and so if you're switching over to heal, you might get creamed before you actually have the ability to cast cure. And then lastly, if the party leader is knocked out, you lose, even if you have phoenix downs or a medic with you, which is just quite dumb. But again, it is good. Can't you tell by how many times I've said it? So let's get moving on to something I'm a lot less positive about. The seventh generation offered cutting edge technology to create large imaginative worlds. And 13 used that to make you run in a straight line. The game is insultingly linear. It's not just that there isn't really an open world. It's that the maps you end up in are extremely constrained and are most often just straight lines. Every now and then there's a blatantly obvious side path which reaches its dead end within like 10 steps. And that side path will pretty much almost always have a chance as a reward for solving the mind-bending puzzles, I suppose. I love places like this. <laughs> and then the other deviation which happens, maybe once or twice, is that there'll be a split in pathways, which will then join up later and by later I mean like the equivalent of a standard home corridor. So it's very easy just to go back and check what you missed. Spoiler, it's nothing. Basically the level design of Crash Bandicoot 2. Chapter 11 is a lot better, but it is still pretty flawed. The open world is definitely a lot more free and honestly liberating after the hours of stuck moving forward. There are a fair number of side paths and you are very much encouraged to explore it with the various mark missions that need to be found and the fact that the chests aren't just stowed away on the well done, you turn 30 degrees from the main path, here's your present me method. It's also enhanced by the fact that there aren't random encounters anymore, and instead the creatures are viewable on the map, seen running around in the world, even getting into fights with each other, it really does create a feeling of actually being in a natural wild. However, the ecstasy provided by finally being free of the corridors of containment does eventually weigh in for two reasons. But in order to detail the flaws of one of those reasons, I do need to make a bit of an important point about the linear criticism I have made. There was an earlier Final Fantasy game which also didn't really have an open world to twaddle about in and plays during what seemed like a succession of levels, and that was Final Fantasy X, which did also receive criticisms for its linearity, but the criticism wasn't as fierce and hasn't been as much of a drag on the overall reception and legacy of the game. And I would say the reason for that is it does a pretty good job of masking its linearity, doing this in two ways specifically. Firstly, there are actually side paths, puzzle and mini games that are available to do as a break from the continuation of the story. And when I say side paths, 
It's actual deviations that lead to secrets which improve the gaming experience. By exploring, you can find the Albert translations, which allow you to understand another language, or the spheres, which give you additional story exposition. Your exploring will also lead you to discovering the minigames that need to be completed if you wish to have the best weapons. As I said, there are minigames which allow you to divert from the main path, and because they contribute to character progression, they don't just feel like a tacked on padding to make the world seem more open. The other large contributing factor to this is connectedness. At any point, okay not any point, in Final Fantasy X, you can head back and return to where you came from. From Xanakin, you can piss off all the way back to Beside if you really want to. And this really contributes to the feeling of it being a world that you are travelling through. Despite the fact that you are predominantly just moving forward, you have been travelling through a whole world. A similar thing could be seen in Dragon Quest VIII. You start out travelling in a linearish direction from the beginning before the world opens up for you basically to go wherever you like. 13 fails with regard to these two criteria. There are no minigames, side quests or puzzles to act as a distraction from the general gameplay loop. Ok well that's not entirely true. I would point to probably 3 clear attempts at providing a deviation to the primary experience. One is the ability to change the weather in the sun and waterscape. You are given different enemies to fight depending on what the weather conditions are, so you are able to think about what path you want to track through the landscape. And as a nice little change as it is, it is very short and it just changes what you fight. So it's not really much of a break from the primary loop, more just a 30 minute variation of it. The second one, in lieu of side quests, are the marks. When traipsing across the wilds of Grand Pulse, you can find sea stones that give you tasks to do. And when I say tasks, I mean enemies to defeat. And while they do add extra things and give you a nice little tour of the landscape, they are just providing more combat. So instead of moving in a straight line to fight enemies, you're just taking a prolonged detour to fight some enemies. The last diversion can generally be considered a diversion, but it only lasts like 5 minutes. You grab a dreadnought and start a small mini game. It's a neat little distraction, but again, it's only like 5 minutes and it's ridiculously easy. On to the second criteria, and it's also pretty egregious. To recap from like 3 minutes ago, Final Fantasy X creates an interconnected world with its more level based style. 13 doesn't. There is no connectivity whatsoever. Apart from at the end of the game, which allows you to walk back to some of the areas, you are never going back to any place you were at before, and it actually feels even more segmented than just that. Often you don't actually see how you got to the place you are at now, the chapter ends with a cutscene, and then begins with a cutscene, and you are now in the area. Off you pop. It really contributes to this feeling of just being a succession of levels. And now that we are talking about cutscenes and a level based structure, we can talk about this. This is not a problem unique to 13, it's infected all the modern Final Fantasies that have had it. To be honest, it's actually an issue in gaming altogether. But it is in 13, so obviously we're going to rant about it here. As if in order to insult you further with the linearity, 13 feels it necessary to tell you which direction you need to be moving in. And again, I can point to two issues with this. First thing, it just inhibits what little bit of exploration might be available. People generally tend to play RPGs for the fun of exploration. Examining the environment, finding all the secrets and sites, discovering side paths and such. But this is made slightly less enjoyable when you have this intrusive arrow continuously attempting to shepherd you in a specific direction. It damages the immersion a bit when you're continuously reminded you need to go a certain way. And this actually even impacts you if you choose to go in the opposite direction, because you deliberately want to avoid the main questline and explore instead. You are deliberately ignoring the arrow and refusing to go in the direction it wants you to. So even by your choice to explore instead, the marker is to some extent having an impact on how you move through the world. And being a slave to the marker leads you to not taking in the world around you, not really learning or appreciating your game world. I will use two contrasting games as an example here. Firstly, Horizon Zero Dawn. There is a part of the main quest line where you need to climb to the top of a facility, needing you to navigate through a series of floors and climbing a lot of debris, but the entire time you have the marker to guide you through your climb, so it wasn't really a problem. However, later I realised there was an item that I needed for one of the side activities, so I had to go back. But of course now, there wasn't the marker to help me back to the top, and I struggled to get back up. I had climbed this before, but because I followed the marker, I did not actually learn the layout and the means by which to ascend. Conversely, when playing Yakuza, pick one the maps don't change much, you really don't have these markers. You have an indication as to where the next story event is, but there isn't an arrow actually showing you how to get there. You need to navigate the map and then determine how to get there. The result of this is learning the layout, 
taking note of landmarks to the point of actually knowing shortcuts to different locations and even streets to avoid if you want to avoid the fight. Just because you've become so customized with the place, you even know where the enemies are most likely to show up. Silent Hill creates a similar situation. If you had to make a guide for someone to show them where to find something in Horizon, you would actually have to show an image on a map. However, if you were to do it for Yakuza, while an image is obviously an extra help, you could just give written directions and the player will most likely be fine since they actually need to learn landmarks and street names. But while this is an issue in 13, the generally limited exploration available means it doesn't make it such a severe problem like that. The second form of training, if you will, which comes with the marker, is actually more of a problem. The way the objective markers are used in 13 reads a pattern. The marker doesn't just show the general direction that you need to head in, but actually points to the specific location of where you need to go. And every time you reach that point, a cutscene activates. A cutscene which mostly just tells you that you need to keep pushing forward, and at which point when the cutscene is done, you're given a new marker to follow so that you can trigger a new cutscene. It just creates this really formulaic feeling of just following a pattern until game completion. Now I realize that technically all games have a cycle of reach a point and cutscene happens, but this just seems to be laying it out too bare for me. You aren't surprised by any event happening, things don't happen organically. And the linearity is also one of the factors responsible for some late game difficulty. Because throughout the majority of the game, you've been generally going through this situation where the thing in front of you has to be fightable since you're moving in a straight line, unless you deliberately ignore leveling your characters, you'll usually be at an appropriate enough level. So any enemy you see, you think you're fine to take on. This again then trains you that every encounter you're going to have is beatable, or at least there isn't a clear delineation between stronger areas and weaker ones. So as a result, you end up getting involved in battles later that you are nowhere prepared for initially. But it seems that I've kind of forgotten that this video was supposed to be a defense and I've just been ranting for ages now. So let's do two segments of positivity, starting with... Probably a bit of a superficial one here, but this game is beautiful. The CGI is outstanding and the in-game graphics are also just very good. Even in comparison to today, it actually still holds up quite well, and I feel like it does a pretty good job of avoiding the sunken, uncanny valley look that a lot of character models of this time fell to. But it's not just the fidelity, it's actually the design as well. Grand Pulse is beautiful, and truly gives a feeling of being a vast expanse, despite you only being able to see a small segment of it. And the sci-fi aesthetic is also interesting and well done. I do believe this game is graphically better than 15, not because of the fidelity obviously, but just because the world designs are more interesting and creative. And that's really all I have to say on the matter. The graphics are really good. I could go on to comment on how correct I was in my previous video when I spoke about Square Enix's obsession with graphics negatively impacting other areas of the game, given how the developers themselves admitted this, but this is supposed to be the positive portion of the video, so I'll just move on. That's right, it's time for the Final Fantasy Music Appreciation segment. I'm actually convinced that Square Enix has a van which they drive around to kidnap up and coming gaming music composers. Never have I seen a company which has always managed to have so many great composers on tap. Though now they'd probably just sell them all for NFTs. In this case, Masashi Hamazu was asked to step up to the plate and he really did knock it out of the park. The combination of orchestral scores and electronic beats working together beautifully. Especially the electronic aspect very smartly knowing when to maybe just leave it as a little bit more muted and infused with the melody and when to give it more of an overpowering situation. One of the more difficult tasks of the JRPG 
That being the game the one average at least 30 hours long, and the player is going to be engaging with many battles, is the need to develop tracks that are regularly repeated, but then also just won't become annoying after hearing them so many times. This has been handled perfectly as well. The looping of the track within the battle would also need to be a consideration, given that 13 battles tend to be longer on average, and again, it's done well. However, like the graphics, there isn't that much else to say. There is the advantages that didn't have a negative impact on the game in any way, but we've come to the end of the positivity. The even slightly perceptive of you might have noticed that these two I've just discussed are much more superficial and technical, and that is really the problem. Final Fantasy 13 succeeds in the technical aspects. The graphics are good, the music is good, the combat system is functional, and the game is well polished. I did not experience any bugs or glitches through 60 hours of gameplay. But the issue is, it fails on the more substantive, well, substantive for JRPGs at least, areas. Yes, it's finally time for this fat internet loser to judge the storytelling skills of far more successful people. Despite me ranting and raving about the world design earlier, it actually isn't that bad. In fact, it wouldn't really have been much of an issue at all if it weren't for the story related problems around it. We can talk about the issues with the world design until the cars come home, but in their defense, a lot of these decisions that were made were as a result of the game's core premise. A premise which also is not that bad, and is also very straightforward. Our five, later six, fellows have been cursed with a fate and are attempting to come to terms with how to deal with it. So what's the problem then? Well, three or four rather important details which hold it back. And of course we are going to discuss those, but I think it is first necessary to look at how 13 displays itself for us. Okay, let's get started from the very beginning here. Okay, the second step, since the game launched with one of those teasers, which kind of preview was coming up in the game. Something which I'm not really a fan of if I'm honest. I've already paid for the game, I don't need it to be advertised to me anymore. If you want to impress me, just have a good introduction to the game that I'm currently playing. But it's not really something I can criticize this game for doing in particular, it's become a bit of a feature of gaming in general over the years. On to the second phase then. Okay, actually the third phase. The second phase is just the menu, which is nice and minimalist I suppose. Anyway, here's a trait. This intro is good. It does feature one problem, which will be discussed later, but we get some characterization, we get a mentioning slash introduction of the core facet of this game's plot, creating a desire to discover more about it, and also we get a good straight to the point illustration of one of the overarching baddies that we will be dealing with throughout the day. From a gameplay point of view, we are pretty quickly thrust into gameplay, and pretty seamlessly at that, apart from a problem that the 7th gen did have when jumping from CGI to gameplay. And you are very quickly given practice with the mechanics, jumping between the options as you will actually need to use potions of here here. Obviously it's pretty limited from the beginning, but it's still fine. Overall it's a very good intro, thrusting you into the action and giving you enough intrigue to continue. In keeping with the memorable openings the series has created throughout the years. However, very quickly the cracks begin to show. These cracks coming from the aforementioned previewed fundamentals, so let's start with the first one. I mentioned in the Type 0 video that characterization and presentation fight alongside each other for the most important features for good storytelling. And having gone through 13 now, I can safely say that characterization is the most important. I also stated that Type Zero's limitations didn't really allow for a great amount of characterization or character moments, which was to the game's detriment. But after going through 13 in its fullness, I can say that maybe too much time with characters can also be detrimental. The characters in this game are just very, very grating. Let's get into depth into just how much. The original plan here was to go through each character speaking about them in detail, but then I realized that that avenue won't really work. And the reason for that is pretty much all of them suffer from the same issues, most notably their inability to just have a basic idea of what to do. The characters spend most of this game just poncing about basically. Alright, I wanted to talk about the plot properly when I got to plot elements, but I realize now a bit of a crash course will be necessary here. 
After lighting and Saz jump off of the train, they and the rest of the Bumble Twice we will be tardy for the rest of this game end up stuck around the Pulse Falsi. The Falsi are like supernatural big boys, who then mark them with the Lassi brand, which makes them Lassi and servants to the Falsi, needing to carry out a specific task for them, but not knowing what that task actually is. Now understandably, this is quite a vexing thing to happen to you, and will probably cause a lot of confusion, doubt and uncertainty. But there is definitely a line to be tread here. We have to spend at least 25 hours of gameplay dealing with Oh, I don't know what to do. Oh, woe is me. Just hours of pissing about with no point to what they actually are doing. Fresh air. Nice. So, where are we headed? Dunno. I mean, even in reality, people who are unsure of what they want to do and are a bit aimless, they still find something to do with their time. And honestly, you could probably have one character who is aimless and just wandering about, but every single one? It is a cancer which spreads through the entire party. Even characters who have shown a modicum of purpose aren't allowed to have it for that long. Take Lightning for example. Probably the best character in the game? just because she generally gets the most characterization and isn't nearly as whiny as the rest. She's also the only one who knows the correct way to communicate with Snow. Well that was satisfying. Let's see it again. One more time. Now slower. Now let's speed it up. You could put her in 6, 7 or 9 for example, and she would still be an acceptable character. She definitely wouldn't be a good character, but acceptable. Anyway, after they're initially branded, Lightning is the only one who seems to have a cooking clue about what to do. She is going to find the falsy who branded her and give it a club. Not the most intense motivation, but still better than, uh, 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 it's so hard. She even wants the others to leave her alone because she knows what useless twists they are. But then later, the gang decides, nope, sorry, you need to be useless as well. Likewise, Fang also generally seems like she has a general idea of what she wants to do, but then they also decide, no, sorry, you're being too confident. And it is really frustrating with these two, because you can actually understand why they do become hopeless. Both of them, but especially Lightning, are thrust with this burden, but instead of collapsing immediately, they internalize it. They endeavour to fight, trying to take everything in their stride, but after a succession of failures, after nothing going right, the weight becomes too much, and then they lose their will to continue. This is completely understandable, and it's actually good character writing, but since you've had to sit through four other people just going, <laughs> you really do not have the patience for more of it. And to make matters worse, when Fang is having her a moment of doubt, Bloody Saz has the nerve to be like, no, don't be doubtful. Saz tells her this. Bloody Saz. 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 Saz! Saz is one of the worst written characters in all the fiction. I despise him to what is probably at an unhealthy degree. I would rather have to play a buddy adventure of Catchy and Amarant as they take on their arch nemesis Gianni Infantino than deal with Saz for the amount of time required in this game. I hate him so much, my brain actually refuses to remember how to spell his name correctly. He of course suffers from the problem of twattering about, but he takes it to such a different level. Snow aimlessly wanks about, but at least he's genuinely positive about what he's doing. Annoyingly so. People need heroes. Vanilla is at least deliberately written to be the kind of aimless, wistful one. Hope is a bit annoying, but at least even though he doesn't have a purpose generally, he will just shut up and go with what the people suggest. But no no no, not Saz. He will whine constantly and refuse any proposed solution to the situation. He would rather just prat about and complain the entire time. Hey, let's be rational now! Yeah, well hell's not sounding too bad, because this place ain't exactly paradise. Ooh. That's the reason we're let's see. To stop it! To keep Cocoon safe! Yeah, why don't you give us one reason to believe that? One reason- What the hell it does? You're grasping at straws, son! Ooh, me. You 
You two are hopeless. <sighs> Just can't admit it. Damn it. This will make things easier. Uh huh. Yeah, knowing our luck, huh? it's probably missing an engine. What? No brake? They're tracking us. I know that. I know that, but we aren't soldiers. We don't have your kind of stamina. You got enough to complain. Come on, let's get going. Get going to where, exactly? I'm terrified of what'll happen. Smells nice. All naturey. Hmm. Just smells damp. And I think something bit me. When it rains around here, it pours. And then it rains some more. And I think this is actually a good point to talk about the notion of hidden motivation. I can imagine that someone deluded enough to want to defend this might point to the fact that all these characters actually have other intentions they keep secret and we reveal them as we continue on, so it's actually very clever. And while I do agree that it is pretty poor exposition to just have characters broadcast their intentions to everything they meet, that doesn't mean they can just bumble around until the moment of revelation happens. In Final Fantasy VI, Locke has a secret motivation in that he's looking for a means to awaken the girlfriend who he injured and put into a coma, but he still also gives a clear intention of assisting the resistance. In Final Fantasy VII, Kachi is not telling everyone that he's spying on them, well he wouldn't be a very good spy if he did I suppose, but he still has the front of being the fortune teller that wants to see their prediction come true. In Final Fantasy X, Oren is secretly seeking a means of bringing this entire cycle to an end, but still gives this front of just barely being a guardian. Just because you have hidden motivations, it doesn't mean you can't have open motivations. And if we're being perfectly honest, Saz's hidden motivation doesn't even work really. Yes, we're not done with him. His whole thing is that he's filed, was branded as the sea when the foul sea was threatened. And because of this, he has been taken to custody by SICOM, the elite security services. Though perhaps it's more of like a social services thing, since the only reason this actually happened was because he lost track of the little spawning in the first place. So this may seem like a good motivation, and a decent inflation for his sad sackness, but sorry no. Firstly, despite the <laughs> he shows all the time, he doesn't actually seem too bothered by the whole thing. Like he claims the entire reason for him being in this position is due to his plan to get his son back, but now when he's got the abilities that would actually allow him to do so, he like pisses off in the complete opposite direction. And it's not like he just got lost. Lightning wants to go back to the heart of Cocoon, which is probably where you're most likely to find Psycom, and he refuses to go. Instead, he chooses just to feel sorry for himself and runs off to watch a parade while also whining about running out of time. In fact, you know what? We're actually going to make a comparison here with the character from Final Fantasy VII, Barrett. No, it's not just because both of them are black. It's because they share some core similarities. Yes, one of which is that they are black, but they both use guns as weapons. They both have a child who, through circumstances, they are unable to be with at all times, and these circumstances are genuine ones that they are responsible for in some way. They were also related to some kind of industrial building slash foundry, funnily enough. But while Saz basically runs away from his child, and then spends the rest of the time feeling sorry for himself, Barrett shows very different behaviour. For those who aren't in the know, Barrett used to live in the town of Coral. While he was there, he was a key influence in getting the town to become connected to the Shinra power grid. However, following an explosion in the reactor, Shinra believed it to be some kind of insurrection, and so retaliated by burning down the entire town. The result of this was the death of the majority of the town, including his wife, and to his knowledge, his closest friends. Now, this is pretty clearly worse a thing than what Sir Wingelot did, so how does Barrett react? Well, he takes up guardianship of his friend's now orphan child, and then forms, or joins according to the remake, a revolutionary group to fight the people truly responsible. So again, just because you have some inner turmoil, it doesn't mean you just get to agonize about everything all the time. It's time to move on from this. But I do quickly want to make one final point to the person who doesn't exist that might still want to defend the idea that this bumbling around in uncertainty is due to them being unwillingly thrust with this fate, they aren't exactly sure what it is. I will counter that with two of the best written characters that Final Fantasy has ever created. In Final Fantasy VI, Terra and Celes undergo a huge amount of trauma. Terra is ripped from her parents at birth and mind controlled to carry out genocide. When broken free, she is forced on the run before being responsible for opening the gate to the world of the Espers and causing even more suffering. 
Sailors are struck with the horror of what her allegiances have led her to, and upon attempting to abandon them, she is imprisoned, tortured, and presumably said to be executed. And then when she joins the resistance, she is treated with huge suspicion and spends the majority of the game torn between these allegiances. And then of course there's the whole world annihilation thing. On top of the problems they've had to deal with, they are then left to live in a world mostly destroyed and mostly devoid of life, where further death can be ran down without warning. A world that is truly inherently meaningless, and where the point of existence is just questionable. And yet they are able to find some purpose within it. Sellers attempts suicide, and still shows more conviction, more purpose, more will to live than these bumbling twats. Or alternatively, you could point to what Final Fantasy IX did when they had a character too defeated to find motivation to continue. They just didn't include her in the game for most of her indecisiveness. So no, being conflicted does not allow you to be useless. But I do think we really need to move on now. Okay, I know I said we need to move on, but I think I need to be fair and point out one good characterization thing here. The relationship between Vanille and Fang is actually very well done. They're the only two characters who are supposed to have known each other for a long time, and it shows. They have a clear chemistry and a clear dynamic, Vanille being the younger, more kind of unsure of herself one, and Fang being the older, more guardian one. And the dynamic is very much on display. Vanille clearly looks up to Fang, doesn't want to disappoint her, and seeks her approval while Fang clearly shows a uh, care and a concern over all of Vanille's actions. That's all. Let's move on. On to another character-based issue, but for the other side this time. Your villains, enemies, foes and cares are very important to keep an interesting plot going. You want to have a villain who you want to get the better of and defeat, but also who there's appearances or something to look forward to, even if they are a little bit slimy and frustrating. And again, 13 does not achieve that here. The villains are all really just uninteresting and pretty much one note. Be it the Psycom leadership, or Bartandalus, or Dizely if you prefer, they're all just that typical <laughs> smug evil with no variation. The kind of cartoonish evil I mean, just listen to this dude. What else does one do with tools? <laughs> Cocoon is a factory built by Falci. A factory for the mass production of human flaws. <laughs> and it's not even hammy or play for some kind of humor. It's all just dead straight. In 6, Emperor Gestahl is cartoonishly evil, but you have his foil in Kefka, the chaotic irreverent nihilism which undercuts him. I mean when Kefka kills Gestahl, he even remarks about what a pompous windbag he is. In 7, Shinra are cartoonishly evil, but it's done in a much more humorous manner. The Shinra executives are continuously mocked and receive comeuppance for their slugness. The party insults them, their boss insults them, and they just generally conduct themselves in a pretty incompetent manner overall. Even now in the remake, which is seeming to be trying to be a little bit more serious about the things, even the other, they are still kind of really silly and over the top. In Final Fantasy X, Seymour is annoyingly straight-facedly smug, and actually is a bit of a drag on the game, but he isn't the main villain, it's actually the overarching institution here, so it doesn't feel as grating. So the characters which large just aren't up to scratch. What else is a problem? What really doesn't help with the character's behaviour is the way the story is told. The plot seems to suffer from severe ADHD. The game is continuously jumping around, with every cutscene bringing a threatening of going to something else. This is either a jump to another set of characters, or a flashback which might not even be related to what's currently happening. And as you can imagine, this creates a bit of a disconcerting experience, when you continuously are shifting around to different locations and characters. That's not to say flashbacks and scenario jumps are inherently bad. In fact, when a heavy event happens, it can sometimes be good to jump to something to just allow a bit of calm and recollection to take in what has just happened. Or alternatively, you can actually create some intrigue if you set up something to happen, but then jump to something else first. However, this does need to be done well, and also not very often. 
13 doesn't do it very well. As already mentioned, the flashbacks are a little bit jarring, and quite a bit of them also tend to be just pointless fluff. And maybe they didn't have to be. They often exist to attempt to provide more characterization, or delve further into the reasons or being for these prats. Now given the complaints I had earlier, you would think that this would be a good thing, but there's one problem here. I don't like the characters. Moments of further characterization only really work when through normal gameplay and basic plot threading moments, the characters have endeared themselves. If their general reactions and behaviors throughout the game have just been grating and annoying, I'm not going to care when you want to tell me about how their aunt's toe fungus got too severe and now they don't want to wear open toed shoes or something. But this is the problem that 13 seems to have. It wants to do the character moments, but it doesn't want to do the work to make those moments actually have their impact. And this is very much undermined by the real core problem. For the game which would have had the job of setting out the background and universe for a series going forward, 13 couldn't have done a worse job. The core plot is heavily reliant on a key part of the lore, which is fine, but it doesn't do a very good job of articulating it. I went into 13 for this video knowing a lot of the Navoka Solus lore, thanks to playing and doing research for Type 0, and I was still getting confused at times. The issue is that it never really takes the time to explain what is actually going on in its world. Now I've seen the argument that this makes the dialogue more naturalistic for the characters to be speaking about things that they know about, but the thing about that is you still have to find a way to explain these factors to the player. Why do you think the protagonist has amnesia is such a common trope? It gives an easy excuse to just have characters dump all lore without needing to do any kind of subtlety about it. But for an actually good example of explaining lore naturalistically, let us turn to Final Fantasy VII. Seven also has a fair bit of background that isn't simple and that players will need to understand in order to go through unconfused. And also, a majority of it is stuff that characters living in this world would understand and would find it a bit weird to have explained to them in depth. But at the same time, what it also understands is that they will more likely have an elementary understanding of it rather than a full kind of, you know, PhD level understanding and also that certain people will know more than others. For example, when walking through Mount Nibble, the party comes across a natural macro reserve, and of course Sephiroth, being a first class soldier, would know a lot about science phenomena and the other types of things in this world. But you can't say the same for Tifa. She would obviously have a passing knowledge of macro, the live stream, and possibly materia, these are natural things of the world they live in. But she wouldn't necessarily understand how they are related, or maybe even think they're interchangeable in some way. She's only 15 at this point, she's probably too busy thinking about hunky boys and makeup or something. I'm making overly long videos about 13 year old games, obviously I don't know anything about women. So what her lack of knowledge allows is for Sephiroth to explain it to her, and in so doing, we as players also have some lore explained to us. So regardless of naturally or not, Background and lore need to be explained, and while the dialogue may seem natural, except I don't know how anyone can believe the often obnoxiously repeated line, we are pulseless sea, enemies of cocoon, is natural, the lore is attempted to be explained in the most unnatural way. This feature is the biggest villain when it comes to the exposition problems with 13. Either the developers realized that they didn't do a good job of explaining the lore and so came up with it as a backup, or they knew there was going to be a data log and so didn't feel it necessary to put in the effort to detail the lore adequately. Either way, the data log is just a big problem. There is nothing more dragging to the pace than an event has happened, remember to read up on the people, places and past events involved that we haven't explained to you notification showing up. I mean, it's fine to have it to give further information, but it shouldn't be an essential for knowing the basic background. But not only does the data log make this tedious means of discovering what is going on, it actually detracts from the storytelling. Because not only does the data log have the lore snippets, 
but it also documents the story events that just happened. Now, I already don't understand why you would need to read what you just saw, but what makes it worse is that it also tells you what emotions the characters feel about what just happened. What is the point of having voice acting, animations, and facial expressions acting a scene out if you're just going to tell me what emotions I'm supposed to have determined from it? James had watched the video and saw the acts he carried out. It made him feel sad. This is the exposition of Peppa Pig. How about some subtlety, allowing the players to determine what has just happened themselves? Then again, maybe nowadays that isn't the best idea. Anyway, the data log is the underlying problem which is also impacting characterization. Given the complexity of the Novi Kostrovi law, the best way to have tackled it would probably be to focus on a small aspect of it and base your story around that. And to be fair, 13 is actually trying to do that. It mostly just focuses on the Lassie aspect and the impact that such a hate has. And so, it tries to have quite a few character moments to try and emphasise the burden that has been placed on them. But this is undermined by the player being confused by what's going on because the actual law and plot haven't been laid out properly. And regardless of that fact, Constant jumping doesn't really allow much time with the characters. We jump off the train with Lightning and Saz. No wait, now we're playing with Snow. No wait, Hope and Vanille. Okay, we've got everyone now. Never mind, Snow's being left behind. Oh, are we gonna play with him now? Okay, no, he's being captured. Wait, hold on, Fang. That's not how you do it. Let Lightning show you how. <coughs> this really isn't conducive to good storytelling. I will say that the positive of the jumping is that you're forced to jump between different paradigm roles and so you'll become quite accustomed to all of them by the time you have the full party. But it's also contributing to the difficulty problem I mentioned earlier. Another small frustration related to the combat is that every time you change up your party it resets all the paradigms you've customised. And so of course when you've been forced to change your party, this will happen. So unless you painstakingly check your paradigms every time you're going to go into a battle, you won't know what your arrangements are. Also, you obviously don't know what you're going to be fighting, so you might have been leveling up roles that aren't as beneficial for this part of the game, especially since the characters don't learn all their abilities in the same order. But let's stop with this complaining now, because it's finally time to talk about... Yes, it took almost 11,000 words, but we are finally talking about the themes. I won't be talking about it for extremely long though, since they are pretty similar to those found in Type 0, that being the Fabula Nova Costalis core themes of the concept of free will and the notion of fate. And to be fair, if you jump over the expositional problems that I mentioned earlier, it does actually do a pretty good job of discussing it. To elaborate how, I do think it is actually now to finally talk about the plot in some detail. Lightning, who of course is the only one who actually believes in doing something, and Snow head towards the Falsi in order to attempt to rescue Sarah, Lightning's sister and Snow's fiance, from its clutches. Sarah has been turned into a Lassie, and they are attempting to do something about this. Again, a Lassie is a mortal being who is marked by a Falsi in this game as opposed to the crystals in Type 0. This mark gives you superhuman abilities, notably the ability to cast magic, which in this world humans normally need technology to be able to do. The trade off though is that you are the Falsi's servant and must fulfill the focus it designates to you. If you don't fulfill this focus after a certain time, you are turned seeth and become a hollow lifeless husk. The issue with this focus is that it's not made clear to the newly created Lissi what your focus actually is. They are given a vague clue and then they must piece it together from there. In the process of attempting to rescue her, they, and the other hanger-ons who have coincidentally followed them, are forced into being the sea themselves. Notably, Pulse the sea. They are the enemies of Cocoon, you know. Despite the banging on, this is the key point. The world in 13 is split into Cocoon above and Grand Pulse below. These two nations 
are involved in a continued war and the fallacy of them are continuously grabbing people to turn them into what are their soldiers essentially. As discussed, Saz is in this situation because of his poor parenting. Hope has ended up here because of, well, I guess Snow basically. Snow is the leader of a fucking stupidly named resistance group against the authoritarian control of Psycom and convinced Hope's mother to fight with them. And as a result, he believes that his mother's active decision to fight against a tyrannical regime and her result in death is now Snow's fault. So he wants to kill him. Though he mostly just illustrated... <laughs> Sorry, it's been a while since I actually read the script. Though he mostly just illustrates this by seeming like he's constipated the whole time. The final two party members are Vanil and Fang, who mostly just ponce about or seem to follow someone else's orders. But we discover later that they are actually the ones responsible for all the events that have happened, or are to happen. They were designated Pulseless Sea a long time ago, and were actually the ones responsible for the creation of the new Sea. However, we are forced to sit through hours of pleading and woe is me in order to discover this. They go on to discover that their focus is to become Ragnarok and destroy a Cocoon. However, they choose to defy this fate. I won't discuss the ending just yet, because that nonsense needs to be discussed all on its own. What we can discuss so long is that the theme is pretty clear. The characters we hone in on are thrusted with situations that they have no say in and are forced to attempt to handle them. Matters out of their control keep interfering with their lives and attempts to navigate the hurdles are met with further obstructions, and they must decide whether to accept their fate or to fight it. One could even argue that the linear nature of the game works with that theme of being thrust to a specific predetermined fate that you are unable to thwart. And we see the toll that that begins to take, especially with This is the worst chapter in the game, because when it comes to the story, it's the best chapter in the game. Chapter 7 is a point where you finally get to see some payoff. These weird robots whose understanding of emotions up until now seems to have been melodramatic sad sadness or eerie unsettling positivity are finally going to show you some humanity. The burdens they have been carrying, the consistent failures and hurdles that dog them along the way have finally become too much and they can no longer shrug them off. They must finally confront what is happening and what they have done. Hope finally stops whining and actually shows some courage to confront Snow. Even though I still think his rationale is a bit ludicrous. Snow can no longer shrug off his responsibility and has to come to terms with the consequences that his devil may care behaviour creates. They finally come to accept their brands that they have been assigned and while understanding it is still a curse to them, they can at least realise they actually can maybe use them for something, that they actually have abilities that are, have a positive angle. A similar vein is seen in Chapter 8, with the other two characters, but it isn't as impactful since Vanille doesn't actually get the chance to make the admission herself, and Saz, well it's Saz. Apparently Torium specifically wanted Chapter 7 and 8 to be this crucial point, and if that's the case, you really have to say well done. For a writer to plan such a pivotal point and succeed in creating it is a lot more difficult than it might seem, so commendations are in order. However, there is a caveat, unfortunately. After this happens, the story and character behaviours mostly return to type, and then when the new behaviours rear up, they aren't that great either. And this is why Chapter 7 is the worst chapter. It serves an indication that there were pieces in place for a good story, but they just could not find out how to tell it. And when they start to succeed, they then veer away. I quickly want to go back to the Type 0 video now though, because I want to make some comparisons because while both of these games are set in the same lore, there is a very important distinction with what they say. I've already mentioned that the Lassi are branded by the Falsi in 13, whereas in Type 0 it's the Crystals. But that isn't such an important distinction since according to the law, it can be done by either. They just chose different overarching structures. What is noteworthy is how the Lissi are perceived in comparison within the two games. In Type 0, while there is some admission that being Lissi must be a difficult fate to contend with, on the whole it comes across as venerable. 
The scene was shown to be pretty badass generally, possessing the ability to wipe out hundreds of thousands of people to destroy entire fortresses. They are lionized within the game, given positions of power, Lord Zhu, Lady Setsuna. Characters offer themselves up to be the sea. However, within the world of 13 we see quite a substantial difference. Being the sea is a curse, like unambiguously a curse. Pretty much any conversation regarding the sea is just what an absolutely terrible, horrible, bad, awful, debilitating, torturous, abominable, dastardly, atrocious, horrifying, just not very good by any means whatsoever fate to be given. A Lassie is a pariah within their own minds, but also from the society at large. People are terrified of them. Sarah is too scared to tell people around her that she has become the sea, terrified of being disowned by those closest to her. And it is justified what she does tell them. And it's not just the fear of the enemy Lassie, but a distrust of Lassie in general. Even those for the home team are distrust her. Remember Twaz's whole thing that he's trying to do something about his son being a cocoon Lassie? Something that you can't help but feel would be a source of pride for a father in the world of Orient. So why do we see this discrepancy? Well it's time for some filthy markism because we're going to do some material analysis. The world of Orient is one naturalized with war. Death and destruction are accepted as part of life and those the best at doing it are venerated. The entire goal of actions in Orient is to create the Agito, the world's most bestest warrior. So obviously an almost immortal being which can summon powers like this would probably be pretty high on that list. But in the world of Cocoon the conditions are different. There was a weird kind of peace, a very weird one. Like they live under an authoritarian government which regularly purges the unwanted, but on the whole this generally tends to impact the lower classes, surprise surprise. This is a world where war is a thing of the past and the people living in it mostly have a pretty idle existence. The moments we mostly get to see of Cocoon when it's not being attacked is a fireworks show, a massive parade show and a kind of bike race. So it's a lot more hedonistic, for lack of a better word, existence happening here. This means that the prospect of a disruptor, a creator of conflict, is something to be concerned about. The institutions are now able to continuously use this as a threat to keep the populace in check and grateful for the brutal security force overhead. So even though we have different scenarios and different ways of living, we see a similar indoctrination of a way of living and thought which constrains real attempts at self-determination and desires for free will. And this is one of the truly great things we can see from this fabulous series, the ability to use different scenarios to hone in on a shared theme. But unfortunately the comparisons also bring out another 13 problem. It is extremely lacking in subtlety. While Type 0, possibly due to its limitations, is pretty bare bones with going in depth with what it is trying to say underneath its immediate plot, 13 is hitting you over the head with the core theme. A core issue specifically found in the dialogue. I realise that with every new segment I'm claiming it to be the worst aspect, so let me not say that again, but it probably is the most grating. There is this joke that Final Fantasy XII is essentially just Star Wars. I haven't played it enough to truly comment on the validity of such a claim, but I can't actually understand how 13 gets away without being criticised for this. Along with this scene, which looks like it could just be straight taken from a Star Wars movie, the dialogue is so reminiscent of the modern Star Wars Disney style dialogue where when the characters aren't mumbling and feeling sorry for themselves, they feel it necessary to always have some kind of thing to say about every event that happens, a little cocky or witty remark. <laughs> Not so tough now, huh? Hey, hey that wasn't like a challenge now, alright? Hey. Better to die than get sent to Pulse. It's hell without the brimstone. Yeah, well, hell's not sounding too bad, because this place ain't exactly paradise. And participating in this migration. <laughs> migration? More like extermination. Huge. Ah, this is crazy. Then take a nap. Really? Can I? Sure. And when we're taking a dirt nap, you can save them all. No, that's even worse. <laughs> 
No dirt naps today. We're all in this together. Our enemies, the Cocoon Sanctum. Their dreaded Psycom, no less. What's the dread? Psycom's nothing but a whole bunch of bluster and bullying. They've got nothing on Nora. Well, we are the heroes, after all. Yo, boss. What's the plan? Charge in, guns blazing. Hey, that's not a plan. Real heroes don't need plans. I told you, didn't I? Moms are tough. You go skirt chasing, I take care of the kids. Some husband. <laughs> and if it's not one of those two, it's the you can do this, we're a team, we're all together nonsense later on. But most importantly is the way that it's used to hammer themes and exposition. When the game actually bothers to attempt to tell you what is going on, or what it's trying to say, it's done in such a ham-fisted and blatant manner. Like if you didn't realise this game was making some kind of commentary on the concept of free will, it will make sure to let you know. And this beating over the head is actually a bit ironic, since the game seems to forget what it's trying to say itself. This game's ending is really quite bad, gameplay wise, design wise and story wise. From a design point of view, it's just pretty bland, like the area is just not very interesting and it seems to be a bit of a retread of Pandemonium from Final Fantasy 2 in terms of its aesthetic, except in keeping with this game, more linear. And then it also just randomly jumps to this other location for a battle and then you come back. Gameplay wise? It's just pretty boring, it's basically just a series of tedious battles, all of them extremely long and really just seeming to exist to prolong what would actually be a very short final chapter. I realise that the final dungeons of Final Fantasy games tend to be predominantly combat based, but there's usually something else. 6 had the need to swap between party members to open up the different pathways, 7 had the choice of where to put the save point and deciding how to split the party up. 4 had secret passages to find ultimate weapons and other bosses, things that just made the trudging feel a lot less monotonous, but 13 doesn't have that. Okay, actually, let's be fair, we do get to see 13's other puzzle, the Chrissy Crossy. Making its mind-blowing debut in Chapter 9, there will be a number of disconnected platforms which you can connect in any order that you like. That's all. You can just go in a straight line if you want to. And finally, the story. Oh lordy. Alright, so the twist we discover earlier is that Lord <laughs> over here contrived for the people of Cocoon to come into contact with Pulse the Sea because he wanted Orphan, the being responsible for the functionality of Cocoon, to be destroyed. He believes by doing so the creator will come back and fix the world because apparently there's something wrong with it. So our fated fools obviously become quite dedicated to stopping him, but then without really explaining why, Orphan's actually a massive Thuan, so they need to defeat him, which invariably leads to the destruction of Cocoon, which is fine now. And then they've now completed their focus, so they crystallize, but then they just uncrystallize because... Okay, well they don't. Apparently this is explained in the sequel, but I'm still yet to play that to confirm, but anyway, that's a filthy crime. I've said quite a few times before that stories shouldn't need additional material to explain their plots. And yeah, I don't know what... I don't, I don't know what the fuck's going on here. Like the party turns seat but then they don't and Fang goes like feral which pleases little Mr. Bartleby over there but then it doesn't please him. And then we have Lord Dizel's motivation. Have you ever paused to consider our reason for making the sea of men? We found sea are crafted for a single purpose and granted finite power to that end. With men, it is not so. Men dream, aspire, and through indomitable force of will achieve the impossible. Your power is beyond measure. We take the sea, that we might wield such strength. Through you, we obtained freedom from our bondage. And now, your focus alone remains. Not only does this so unsubtly beat the core theme out almost as much as the part is follow-up, 
but it's also absolute bollocks. Like utter nonsense. He's angry at humans because they have the ability to have free will. Meanwhile, Falsy don't. The super worldly, deity like beings who are responsible for the creation and functioning of the world have less free will than humans, he says. This dude has complete control over Cocoon. All its denizens live their lives according to the limited information and rules that he doles out. These six people he's talking to have spent the entire plot running around aimlessly and pissing their pants about everything just because of what he did to them. He actively decided that he wants to break things he's in charge of from his own volition so how can, how can he argue that he has no free will? But the biggest problem with this ending is that it's actually undermining the point that the main theme is trying to make. If your argument is that humans do have free will and are able to dictate their own path, then you really wreck that with this ending. In the end, they do exactly what those above them choose. They complete their focus, ending hearing that they did exactly what was wanted of them. So where's the free will then? Did their decision just happen to coincide with being what their focus was? Now, you could actually use this to make a very good point about the illusion of free will and how we as humans think we are acting as free agents but are always subtly moved to certain behaviours and decisions. But given this monologue... I'd rather fight and lose than give up without even trying! Miracles out of misery. You've got to be kidding me. Yeah, Fang. Who'd be dumb enough to swallow that crock? Sure. We've all had better weeks. Or a life. But you can't be. Could be more Falsi smoke and mirrors. Fang. I'm sorry. We made you go it alone. Second time now, isn't it? <sighs> but where were you? Somewhere cold and dark. Just thinking about everything that happened up until now. And then. And then it was like. It was like. I had a glimpse of the future. You were just smiling and laughing. Sarah. <laughs> Even light. I don't know. A new focus or something. Bacon didn't really make sense, of course. I mean, knowing you were one being though. But luck would have it. Oh. Next thing I know, I feel somebody pushing me right along. You were there too, Fang. Same side. All of us. Together to the end. the sea, the symbol of the focus we all faced, the mark of the fate we all shared, proof of the promise we all made. The heroes never die. Come on, we've got a world to save. 
If we have the power to destroy Cocoon, then we have the power to save it. You say you want your day of wrath, do ya? Well, it's coming right up! Tom, we gave the people what they really want. <laughs> And the really happy bappy nature of the ending, I feel that that's not the case. I haven't played through the sequel, so maybe they'll make the point, but again, you should need other media to explain your plot. Compare this to Type Zero. Class Zero is straight up given a choice of how they wish to proceed. Dr. Horatio makes it clear it is their choice. She genuinely doesn't really care which one they pick. If they choose to put themselves forward as Agito and inevitably get slaughtered, she will just reset the cycle. If not, she will make a concession that allows them to move forward. Good heavens, I've been doing a lot of comparing today, haven't I? There is a scene quite early in the game where Snow meets up with Sarah. Sarah is extremely distressed by her C branding and has kind of lost her motivation to continue. Snow comforts her and they share a happy moment under the fireworks. Those who are aware of the series might be thinking this bears similarities to something in the series past. That's because it does. In Final Fantasy X, a distraught unit is comforted by Tardis and they go on to create one of the series' most iconic moments. <laughs> no, not that one. The two scenes are very similar, but also very different. This point in Final Fantasy X happens a long way into the game. By this point, we have seen Sin, the overarching evil, wreak its havoc, a large group of people are murdered in what is essentially a suicide mission. The one part of Yuna's family, who have regularly been subjugated to racism throughout the game, have their home destroyed. We discover the system which exists in this world is fundamentally corrupt. And through all of this, Yuna must sacrifice herself if she wishes to bring an end to the damage Sin causes. But also only for 25 years, at which point Sin will return. Despite this, the entire time she has dedicated herself to this task not even really considering that she has a choice in the matter. And then when she finally does realize she actually has some choice, she initially chooses her own happiness, but quickly realizes she is unable to do so. She feels she must give herself up for the larger happiness of her society. And all Tyrus is able to do in this is provide her a moment of happiness, one moment in which she can forget her obligations. So what's the difference between this and this? Well, to put it simply, everything that I've listed with regards to Yuna is stuff we actually see. We are given the means to understand her conflicts and turmoil, and are glad that she gets to have this one moment of joy. We don't see any of this with Sarah. We aren't given a chance to understand the pain her situation causes her. Some of it is shown later, but even if it was shown before the scene, we still wouldn't really have enough background to elicit a notable reaction. And this is really an overarching problem in 13. It regularly takes moments from other Final Fantasy games, but doesn't seem to understand why they were impactful. The ex-soldier and part in the jumping off of a train against the authoritarian regime from 7, the aforementioned scene from 10, the ruler turning out to be a secret malicious being from Final Fantasy 4, the backstory of Barrett from Final Fantasy 7, the government giving its people a general feeling of peace and order while using the fear of a force from the outside to maintain their position from 10, the evil Sid from 12, the being on the run from the Empire from 2 and 6, sneaking past the authoritarian regime from 7, a young character being stuck with the person inadvertently responsible for the death of their parent from 4. When I do a video on this channel, I try and judge the media on its own merits, but that is pretty hard to do here, because 13 seems dedicated to tie itself to what came before it. 13 is Tony's crew. It exists as a simulacrum of its ancestors, desperately attempting to always bring up what came before it, but at the same time not being accurate representation of what it actually came from. And this is extremely disappointing given the context. 13 was the first Final Fantasy game to begin development without the presence of the series founder, an opportunity to trend forward into new horizons. And there are parts where it looks like it's going to do that, but then it quickly turns in on itself and grabs onto things it knows people liked in the past, but not knowing how to implement them. So given this litany of criticisms, why defend it? Because despite the many flaws, 13 is attempting to do something interesting. By trying to carve itself out an entire universe and lore, setting up an entire series to base itself off, 13 comes across as an earnest attempt at doing something creative, an actual work of passion. 
Increasingly over the years, Square Enix has become a bottom line dominated company. Notably, they have become obsessed with live services and relatively cookie cut releases which only exist to continue to siphon money, avoiding to make any attempt at some kind of creative endeavour. A far cry from the Square soft golden era. At the time of the great success of the Final Fantasy franchise, the company was happy to use this as a fulcrum that they could launch more experimental titles off of. There was the survival horror RPG Parasite Eve, the FMV adventure Another Mind, the one-on-one -on -one dueling Bushido Blade, the side-scrolling shooter Ironhander, the kart racer Chocobo Racing, the arena fighter Urgars. Even within the Final Fantasy franchise, they would tinker with battle systems and made games like Tactics. Now obviously not all of these were successful or good, but they were attempted. We see a different story today. The generally negative reception the 13 series received left the company doing a bit of a U-turn, to the point where the last game in the Crystal series, 15, reverted pretty much to just dropping the entire series law. In fact, apart from the gameplay tweaks, the game was extremely safe and pretty much bedded itself completely in the comforts of the tried and tested Final Fantasy plotlines. And this is what we are seeing coming from the company. Final Fantasy is still the reliable fulcrum they are held around, but rather than using that for the experimentation of the past, it has been a cavalcade of live services which have had an average life cycle of like 3 weeks. And even the Final Fantasy games themselves have basically just been remakes, ports and remasters. And all this does is propagate a cycle which stifles taking risks. I'm in no way opposed to the idea that younger people, or those who missed out, get to play some of gaming's great classics, but it does lead to this idea that this is the way the games have to be. Recently, Naoki Yoshida, who is overseeing production for the upcoming Final Fantasy XVI, caused a bit of a stir when he stated they were not going to ground the upcoming release in games from the past. And that's a good thing. Series of franchises need to move forward and not get bogged down in treading the same ground over and over again and 16 is just moving forward with a trend the series used to do well. The games were always willing to use different settings, themes and mechanics. After only one game, they had already chinkled with the leveling system. 9 served as a celebration of the series, but still did its own thing. But yet 13 ended up stuck in the limbo. It's not a bad game, but in comparison to what has come before it, it's dragged down into being a punching bag. Ironically, or maybe fittingly, it fell victim to the very fate its plot discussed. It was given the focus to move the series into a new direction, but wasn't sure how to do so and as a result ended up a husk, stuck as a testament to its purgatorial state of attempting to diversify, but too scared to move away from its heritage. If you had a wonderful time with this video, please be so kind as to like and subscribe. The next video won't be about any Final Fantasy game, because honestly, I need a little bit of a break, but stick around because there will be more coming soon as well as other wonderfully fun things.